Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Monmouth County Virtual Library. We are delighted you are with us today. Please sign up for our electronic newsletter on the library's website for updates on all of our virtual events and information on in-person services. Please share the library with your friends on Facebook and Instagram. Your microphones are all muted. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat and we will address them during the Q&A portion of this program. Joining us this morning is Monmouth County Division of Consumer Affairs Director, David Salkin. Thank you, David, for joining us this morning and please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I think the topic that we're gonna to discuss today is very important for your safety. And when you talk about some of the things that we see every day, you'll understand why, why you're here today because some of what we see is pretty shocking. Uh, my name is Dave Salkin. I am the Director of the Division of Consumer Affairs for Monmouth County. Our job is to enforce the Consumer Fraud Act. And um, me personally, when I'm out on the road, my job is to educate uh, and try to prevent fraud from happening. Inside the office, we investigate, mediate, and if necessary, try to prosecute through special counsel. We see a little bit of everything, and we're going to talk about um, not only what we see in the office, but some of the things that you can do to protect yourself. Let's see if I can get myself to advance on the screen here. Let me use the advance button. Actually, just, there we go. Hang on. I go back on this thing. Okay, sorry about that, a little technical glitch. So mom always used to say that smart was learning from your mistakes and wise was learning from somebody else's mistakes. And the goal today is to learn from other people's mistakes and avoid making them yourself. Um, one of the reasons people get taken, especially whether it's online or on the phone, is because you're trusting because you're honest. And the expectation is that the folks that you're talking to are also honest. And here's the bad news, people will lie right to your face. Particularly seniors tend to get victimized when we come uh, to phone scams. And I think the reason is the younger generation is uh, more likely to use texting to communicate. And half the time they don't even answer your phone. If you've got kids or grandkids, you know that. Um, but when you're my age or older, when the phone rings, you always grab the phone, especially if you have a house phone feel compelled to go running over and answer the phone. And I will tell you that I get so many bad phone calls a day that my iPhone is set up so that if you're not in my list of contacts, it automatically goes to voicemail. And that cuts out about 90% of the phone calls I get that I don't want to deal with. If one of your friends is trying to reach you and you set up your phone that way, they'll be able to call you. But if it is um, some sort of spam or a robo call or somebody trying to scam you, it will go to your voicemail and nine times out of 10, they won't leave you a message because it's not gonna work the way they want it to. They have to have the urgency, they need to talk to you immediately if it's gonna be able, you know, if they're gonna be able to scam you. So um, my first advice to you would be to set your phone so that you only get calls from people that are in your list of contacts. So the top scams that we see, and most of these are, like I just said, these are phone scams, would be things like getting a call from the Social Security Administration, the IRS, uh, tech support. These are the calls you get where, and, and when we talk about them right now, I'll tell you that you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, this is so obvious that it's a scam. It's only obvious because we're having a discussion in the topic of um, security and scams and that type of thing. But when it's the middle of the afternoon and you're, and you're busy doing something else and the phone rings and you grab it and someone sounding very official from a government agency, uh, th these guys are good at what they do. They're very convincing. And so even though it may be obvious now, when you're a senior and you rely on your social security check and someone tells you that you've been locked out of your social security account and you're not gonna get your check this month unless you talk to them, you tend to listen and that's the problem uh, because you answered the phone in the first place. So I will tell you that the Social Security Administration, the IRS, they do not call you ever. You're gonna get a registered you know, mail uh, communication to start things off from the government 
then you're going to have to call them and you're going to know you're calling the government, you know, based on what, how the letter is done. And so you're going to sort of start the ball rolling if you're ever dealing with the government. The government just ran, does not randomly call people and they especially don't call people and ask for money. Also, tech support. Uh, if you have a computer, you get phone calls from tech support telling you that you're uh, your computer's been hacked and you've got a problem and they're there to help you or it's time to update and they're there to help you. Let me tell you, there are 350 million Americans with multiple devices. There are hundreds of millions of computers in this country. Tech support doesn't just randomly call people because they're nice and they have the time to make these phone calls. If you've ever had a problem with your computer and you try to reach somebody on the phone, you know how impossible it is to talk to a live person. There are not live people in tech support just randomly calling to be helpful and calling you in your home to try to get you, you know, to help you fix your computer. If someone calls you from tech support, hang up. Um, the people that do talk to them end up giving these people access to their computer. And once they're inside your machine, you have a big problem. They can install ransomware. They can get into your password. They can get into your bank accounts. They can steal from you. They can get all your personal information. It is a nightmare. So again, unless you call tech support, tech support does not call you. Uh, the dating sites, this is always one of my favorite topics to talk to when I have a live audience of seniors, because this is hilarious. If you have kids or grandkids or great grandkids, they would be horrified to think that their you know, parents, grandparents, great grandparents are still interested in SEX, never mind that they might even know what it is and the fact that they might be on a dating site. And I can tell you that seniors do a lot of dating when they're when they're either you know divorced or widowed, widowed or whatever, and and they're lonely. And so they go on to these dating sites, and sure enough, they're going to find somebody, and the person that they find has all of the same hobbies, the same interests, the same number of grandchildren. They're all the same ages. Everything that you love, they love all the same stuff, and very quickly. The lonely senior is entwined in a very hot and heavy romance, and the person has decided that they're in love and they want to come visit you, and so you set up the date that they're going to come and fly out to your city. And then two days beforehand, they call you up heartbroken because their great-granddaughter needed an operation and she didn't have insurance, and so he had to use all of his money to pay for her surgery, but he loves you and he wants to come visit you. If you would just send him the $500 for the airfare, He'll give it to you in cash when he sees you. And so you send the money and your date disappears and then never to be heard from again. And I can't tell you how many times that happens. Uh, the other common one with dating sites is not necessarily for seniors, but for younger folks, they, they start a romance with somebody who's in the military and would love to see them, except they're in Afghanistan or Iraq or someplace around the world. That's a hot spot. It's very dangerous. And so this is all very romantic and sounds, you know, gallant. And then they get jammed up and they need money. And because you're patriotic and you love them and you're going to send them money and they don't call you back either. So again, uh, dating sites never send anybody any money. And again, these folks, they, they should win Oscars for their performances. They're very good at what they do. Um, one of the things that I always like to, to tell people is that we have this sort of preconceived notion that criminals are dumb, and that is not correct. Criminals are some of the brightest people you'll ever meet. Some of them are super intelligent when it comes to not only computers, but when it comes to what we call social engineering, which we'll talk about later, and that is when you're pretending to be somebody else. These folks, they could sell ice to Eskimos. I'm telling you, they are very convincing. Just avoid the conversation so you don't get duped. Um, the COVID vaccine scams are a new one, obviously, because COVID's only been around for a year and a half. Um, but these are dying down now because most people who are wanting to get vaccinated are already vaccinated. But as you probably know, you don't have to pay for one. And you also can't pay to jump to the front of the line. Um, we're going to see less of these now. But that was one that in the beginning, people were desperate to get vaccinated. And they were getting phone calls from folks that sounded very convincing who for a small fee would get you vaccinated right away. And of course, all they did was take your money. Some of the scams we see aimed at younger folks are dealing with college scholarships um, or, or loans for college. Obviously college is very expensive. Um, and some of the things that you should pass on to folks who you know are gonna be seniors this year and looking at colleges, a real scholarship does not charge an application fee. 
Sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how many folks think that for $25, they can apply for the scholarship and then they find out that they didn't get it. Um, bank fees for low interest loans. You know, if you're going for a college loan, you should never have to pay to fill out the paperwork. They're going to dupe you into thinking that you're eligible for $200,000 and you just got to give them $500 to get the bankroll started there. And then, of course, you never hear from them. Um, and then another thing that we like to talk about, uh, if you've got kids, grandkids, great grandkids, younger folks like to play online games with other players. You should always know who these other players are if you've got little kids. Um, you know, it's a scary thought, but there are pedophiles and weird people out there who you don't want talking to your children. Ask your kids if they're playing online games with people that they don't know. It's one thing if they're playing with their neighbors. It's another thing if they're playing with a 40-year-old who's pretending to be a nine-year-old, and that can be kind of scary. So just, uh, you know, know what they're doing. Okay, this is my advice for the day. If you get nothing else out of this, it's this, it's hang up. Um, again, you know, these people that are calling you, they're really good. I just heard of a new one. This was a, a new a scam to me. And this was Comcast called a friend of mine who has Comcast and said that they had a new program where they were gonna offer them half price billing and gonna include some great channels and gave them a big song and dance about what they could do. And when they got to the part about, you know, having to give them their financial information, you know, so that they could do monthly billing, it occurred to the person, my friend, that they should have already had all that information because they get monthly billing already. And it was at that point that they hung up the phone. But um, it's, it's a, you can Google that scam, um, the Comcast scam, and you'll see that it, it's uh, pretty convincing and people do get scammed every day with that one. Um, another one is lottery winnings. People, you win a cruise, you've won a prize. If you've ever entered a contest of any type, you know how hard to, it is to win a contest. It is especially hard to win a contest if you haven't entered the contest. So when people call you to tell you you've won something, all you got to do is pay the tax on your brand new car, hang up the phone. Or like I said, don't answer the phone in the first place. So, you know, why do these, you get all these phone calls? Why do people do this? And the answer is because it works. The social security scam alone has already resulted in an estimated loss of $17 million. So that means if, if people were just sending in 500 bucks to unlock their account, that happened 34,000 times successfully. So they just blast the stuff out there and they get, you know, they're just playing the odds. I think, uh, you know, last year there was something like 34 billion robocalls. That's a crazy number, um, but you just, you really don't answer the phone. One of the things you'll find if you get these phone scams, they all share one fact, and that is that there's a big sense of urgency. When they call you up, especially if it's going to be in the middle of the night with what they call the granny scam, that's when somebody calls and they act like they're one of your grandchildren and they've been arrested and they need bail money and they're terrified and they sound like they're crying and they're hard to understand on the phone. They're hard to hear. So you, it could be one of your grandkids. It's so hard to hear. You're not really even sure. But you hear when you, you know, when your grandkids crying and sounding hysterical, and if you don't send them money, they're not going to, they're going to jail. When that happens at like 1130, 1230 at night, when you've been sleeping and you're, you're wake up groggy, that's, that's how you get snagged because they, they are counting on you not being alert enough to think it through. Most of these scams, if you let it go to voicemail, if you were to listen to it without that sense of urgency or talk to one of your friends or family members about the call you got, you would realize that it was a bogus call. It's when they catch you off guard and they're rushing you or intimidating you because they're you know, a quasi-governmental agency um, and they're, they're making you do things you know, in a hurry, that's when you give away your money. So you're not being rude when you hang up on somebody. In fact, it might be the only justice you ever get when dealing with these criminals. Hang up. And if you really want to enjoy it, just slam the phone down if you still have an old-fashioned phone that you can do that. Um, it's, it's okay to hang up the phone. I, I know you were raised to be polite, but there's too many people out there who are there to uh, rip you off. There are some steps you can take besides going uh, and setting up your phone not to take calls from strangers. You can register with the National Do Not Call Registry, but that only helps you with the legitimate marketing companies. It does not prevent the bad guys from calling you. There's something called spoofing, which is done pretty commonly uh, by criminal enterprises. And that is, 
when you get these phone calls, sometimes you're envisioning somebody sitting in a phone bank, you know, on the phone, making these phone calls all day long from someplace. And that's really not what it looks like. It is a computer program that somebody's doing from their laptop. It could be in the Ukraine. It could be in Iran or North Korea or Russia or China. It could be anywhere in the world. And they're using a computer program, which is going to send out in one split second, several hundred thousand phone calls. And those phone calls, depending on where they go in the world, will grab your area code and your prefix, your first three numbers of your phone uh, number. And so when the phone call comes in, it looks like it's coming from your geographical area because they know that you're much more likely to answer the phone if you think it's one of your neighbors than if the area code was from a foreign country. That's happening by laptop somewhere. That is not happening uh, on the phone. And that's why it's almost impossible to ever trace these things because you can't trace an IP address very easily the way you can with uh, you know, caller ID or something like that. So again, um, you, know, you can put filters on to block the spam and you can use the do not call registry. But at the end of the day, the easiest thing to do is just not answer your phone in the first place. So all of these scammers, People say, well, you know, why are they going to call me? I'm not a millionaire. What do they want from me? Well, they do want your money. That is true. Um, the easiest thing they can do is get you to send them uh, a, either a, um, a credit card information or you'll send them a wire transfer or you'll buy a gift card and give that to them. They, they get money from you a lot of different ways. But the other thing they can get from you, which is not actually cash, is all of your data. And data is worth money. Your contact list has a street value, your credit card information, your social security number, any personal information they can get from you has a value. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what would they do with it? Why, you know, if, you, if I, my, my name and phone number and my address, that stuff is all out in the world already anyway. Yes, it is. But somebody who is trying to impersonate you might have five or six of the 20 things that they need to really become you. And every time they can add one more piece to that, they get closer and closer to being able to steal your identity. So if they have your, your driver's license, your social security number, and they have your name, address, phone number, um, even some basic background stuff that people might post on something like Facebook, like what college did you go to? What's your hometown? Uh, your list of friends, the, the names of your kids and your grandkids. All of that data is all used and it all has a street value. So on the dark web, which we'll talk about in a split second, this information is bought and sold um, like anything else is bought and sold. It, is, it, has, it has value to scammers, which is why you want to protect your data and why you never give anybody access to your computer. So when we talk about the web, everybody's heard of Google and you know the different search engines and that's what you see at the surface on what we call the open web or the clear web. That is what most people are familiar with. And it's what we use every single day. The deep web is not necessarily nefarious. The deep web is just things that are encrypted, whether it's your medical records, legal documents, passwords, your banking information, all of the stuff that you use every single day, but needs to be secure exists in the deep web. And that just means to get to that information you have to go through firewalls, you need a password, you need you know, a username and password and access to the information. It's not open to the public. It's not bad, it's just secret. And then at the bottom of that iceberg picture is the dark web. And the dark web is where all of the bad stuff lives. It was really what prompted the invention of all the cryptocurrency that you're seeing nowadays. People wanted to have money available to them that the government couldn't trace. Some of that could have been because they didn't want to pay taxes on the money, but more likely it's because they're using that money to buy drugs, to buy people. Um, I mean, the slave trade, uh, human trafficking, that stuff happens. It's the most horrible stories you'll ever hear. It could be kitty porn. Um, it could be, like I said, you know, it, it could be buying children. I mean, all this stuff, the stuff, the horror stories that you hear, it happens in the dark web. You need a, uh, an onion router or a Tor encrypted router to get down there and access that stuff. Um, and my suggestion is don't ever do it because unless you are somebody who's really familiar with cybersecurity, the minute you enter the dark web, your computer is about instantly hacked. They will, they will be inside stealing your information. 
So um, I, I just, I like to tell you like what it is, the dark web, but I don't suggest you ever go there yourself. Um, leave that for uh, the CIA, the NSA, all the big initial companies and for the criminals that use it. The original intention of the dark web, it started out, the United States Navy used to use it uh, to communicate uh, in, in secret on the web, but they realized early on that, you know, the US military that if they were the only ones there that everybody else would access it and know that they could get in there and just find the US military. So that kind of blew their cover. So it was sort of opened up to anybody who wanted to use it. The problem is, you know, the people that went down there ended up being all the criminals. So we're going back to identity theft. We, there's phishing and then there's phishing with a PH and then what we call spear phishing or even whaling. And that has to do with using information to acquire your target. And so without beating this one to death because it's a little, it's a little complicated, let's say you, you wanna get the um, CFO of a large company. And the reason you want this person is because they have the ability to write checks or do wire transfers for a large corporation. The chances of you getting to that person directly are very, very slim. I mean, could you call the president of Coca-Cola or Pepsi or some giant company and just speak to the boss? I doubt it. So you're going to have to start with way down on the table of organization, uh, someone else to gain access. And so the way that works is uh, if I'm a bad guy, I look up online some of the department heads and I learn the names of the people that are all at all the different levels in the company. And I find out who the head of IT is. And then I call up a secretary or you know, an administrator who's far down on the food chain. And I pretend I'm from IT because now I have a name. And I tell them they've had a problem you know, with uh, the boss's phone and I need to get to them. I need their phone number. And I can you know, make up whatever story it is to get information and gain access to the person who I'm ultimately trying to get to. And you'd be shocked when an inter-office mail arrives and it looks like it came from somebody that you work with and it's telling you that you have to wire money. Now, big companies that wire money every single day, this is not an unusual request when you know, the person who, who you work with every day says, all right, we need to wire $4 million to this account. If you've done seven of those this week, it's not a big deal. The problem may be that the email address has been stolen or it's been modified very slightly. The letter L is now the number one, which looks exactly the same in small print. And so it may look like somebody who it's not, and then you wire money. And I can tell you that when money is wired, the chances of you ever seeing it again are just about zero. So companies now have to have protocols in place where you need face-to-face -face communication. You've got to do more than just email. We had a case with a school board uh, here in Monmouth County. Uh, they showed me a bill that they received from one of their vendors and the person was getting ready to write a check to the vendor. But because it was a large amount, it was for a, a, con a consultant that was in Texas and it was about $8,000. Before they, they wrote the check, they called uh, the treasurer and they said, I'm getting ready to send out the request that you sent me on this bill, but I wasn't familiar with the name. Do you know what it was for? Long story short, um, it came from an outside source that was not related to the school at all, but somebody had hacked into the school's website and got into their mail and saw what their bills looked like. And if you took the fake bill and put it next to a real bill, they looked exactly the same. The only reason they didn't lose that money was because somebody was smart enough to ask a question about something that looked a little suspicious. You have to really be vigilant and go slow. You can't rush through your, your work if you're working at a company that's dealing in money that is sending it places where you're not gonna see it again. Passwords. <clears throat> everybody knows what a pain in the butt it is to have to change a password every 30 days or 45 days or whatever it is. And I'm going to tell you, do it. Because having a password is no longer sufficient. You now have to use a passphrase. If you look on the bottom left of the screen there where it says password one, you'd be shocked how many people are lazy and use password one even to this day. Or they'll do one, two, three, four, five, or they'll do ABC, whatever it is. They'll use their own first name with the number one. There are so many lazy passwords out there. 
that literally will be hacked by software in less than one second. If you look at the amount of time it takes to crack a password, it's shocking, right? But each time you add a character, <clears throat> excuse me, it gets more difficult. By the time you're up to 11 or 12 characters, it's very, very difficult to break your password. So you might use something like that sentence. Only three of my five grandkids ever call exclamation point, exclamation point. So we've used numbers, we've used letters, we've used special characters, and we've written a sentence instead of used the password. My suggestion is you all do that today. Don't wait, do it today. And write them down on a piece of paper. Do not open up a Word file and store your passwords on your computer, which is another common mistake people make. Um, if I was to go in your computer, would I find a file that says passwords on it? And would it contain your local bank with your username and password and your retirement information with your username and password and access to your social security? If I hack into your computer and your passwords are stored there, I just hit the mother load. I can steal everything you've ever worked your whole life for. Do not store it there. Write it down on a piece of paper with a pen like the good old days and keep it locked in a drawer where only you and maybe one other trusted person know where it is. Um, you also don't want to use the same password for all of your different accounts. It's obviously much easier, but if somebody steals your password, now they've got everything. So honestly, take the time to make long creative passwords and keep them someplace secure. Public Wi-Fi. This is another one that um, you should be aware of. A lot of times you'll walk into your local coffee shop and there is open Wi-Fi. Uh, open Wi-Fi means that everyone can have access to the net and they're not, they're not charging you for it. It's free, which is great. You'll notice though on the Wi-Fi, when it, when it shows you the list of available networks, there's a padlock next to the name of the network. If it's an open padlock, it means you can just hop right on. If it's a locked network, it means you need the password. If you're using open network, which is typically what happens in public at these coffee shops and airports and whatever, it means that whatever data is going in and out of your computer is available for other people to look at. Um, people who are good at this stuff, they can get into your computer if you're on an open network. So if your coffee shop has a password, that's fine. Get the password, unlock the network, and then you can use it. Another common thing that happens is particularly at airports, places like that, if you look at the two plugs in the picture, one is a three-prong electrical plug and one is a USB port. USBs can be used to charge your, either your phone or your computer. Pretty common that people plug these things in at airports and other places. The top left plug, only electricity can go into your device. The other plug, data, can go into your device or out of your device as well as electricity. So while you're charging, you're also getting the possibility of collecting malware or having your data sucked out through that port. So my suggestion is, if you need to charge your device, only use an electrical plug, do not use a USB port. Online shopping. This one is a doozy and we could talk about this for the next five hours. This is what my office deals with every single day. And this goes back to what I was saying before about criminals not being dumb. Criminals are really, really good at this stuff. For a few hundred dollars, I can buy a package online and open up my very own online shop because the package that I bought sets me up with a website and is going to furnish me with beautiful pictures of merchandise that I do not own. But it sure is going to look convincing. Um, the bridal shop on the bottom left, this is a real story that we saw. Um, you may have heard me tell this tale before because it's, it's pretty shocking. There was a woman whose daughter was getting married. She wanted to buy this big designer dress, mother of the bride dress. And it was, a, I don't know, let's say it was a $10,000 dress because it was from some fancy designer. And she found it online for half price because they sell direct to the public. And all she would have to do is buy it at the discount and bring it to a tailor and they could do the alterations and it would be half of what she would normally spend. So she sends in, you know, half price deposit and then they contact her and they say, okay, we're getting ready to ship it. We need you to send the balance. So they send the balance and lo and behold, the dress never arrives. And now it's getting closer to the date. And so she's trying to reach these people and she's calling and she can't get through to anybody. And now she's thinking, maybe I got scammed. So she calls her office. She gives us the address of the uh, store that's affiliated with the website. 
We go there and the store is on the bottom right. It's a UPS store with a post office box and good luck ever trying to find these folks. And the people who run the UPS store or these drop and ship places, you know, they come out with a box from the back full of irate letters saying, where's my merchandise? Send me back my money. And of course, these people have already split and we will never, ever find them. We had one last month. Somebody bought a puppy online. They wanted a Frenchie. These little French bulldogs are so cute and they're in demand, so they're hard to find. So you go to this website, you see a picture of 20 of the most adorable puppies you've ever seen in your life. You're instantly in love. Each one has a number or a name. You pick your puppy, you send them your $4,500 for this thoroughbred or whatever pure breed puppy. And then you have to wait for them to wean the dog and send it to you. Then you get a notification saying, okay, we're ready to ship your puppy. It's $700 for the crate and the airfare. And so now you got to give them more money. And then a couple of days go by and they say, oh, we just found out your community requires a dog license. We need another couple hundred dollars. At this point, the person started getting a little suspicious. So they called us. I spoke to the person and turns out the area code, they were dealing with somebody in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It took me about one second to plug in the area code into my computer and realize that it was San Diego, not Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's the first red flag. The second thing I did was I typed in the name of the business into Google, and lo and behold, the business comes up with tons and tons of complaints and warnings that this is a scam. It literally took me 10 seconds. Somebody just paid $5,000 to a stranger online and never bothered to look to see if there were any complaints. This happens all the time. You would be shocked how many people don't become detectives until after they have been ripped off. If you're gonna send somebody money for something and you don't know these people, you better go online and check their reviews. Even Amazon or um, uh, Walmart, some of these big sellers online, sometimes they're selling you merchandise from them and sometimes they're just providing their web service to smaller vendors who operate under their umbrella. So sometimes you think you're buying something from Amazon and you're actually buying it from another business. If you have a problem, sometimes Amazon will help you and sometimes Amazon won't because it, you didn't buy it from them. So again, if you're gonna buy something online, Google the name of the business and start looking at reviews. If you see a business that only has three reviews and two of them are one-star reviews and you see they have a better business bureau grade of F, do not send them anything. <laughs> do not give them your money. Uh, sometimes you know, you're going to send them money and not get the merchandise, and that's one way that you get ripped off. But the other way, which is equally bad, is you've just given them your name, your address, your phone number, and your credit card information. Two seconds after you've placed your order for merchandise, they're placing their order for merchandise using your credit card and buying all sorts of good stuff that you're going to get billed for next month and be shocked when you've got a bill for $35,000 for stuff that you never ordered. You know, some credit card companies are good about backing you up, but something you need to keep in mind is if you ever use a bank card, that's the equivalent of you writing a check. You're not charging it. It's coming directly out of your checking account. That money is typically not able to be recouped. If you bought something with a Visa or an American Express or a MasterCard, if you file a, a claim against the company, your credit card company will sometimes give you your money back and try to recoup it from the business. Um, and if it's a scam, you know, the big credit card companies, sometimes they just write that off as a loss, but they'll make you whole. If you used a bank card, the bank does not do that. The bank says, you know, you, you sent that money to somebody, that's on you. And they will not give you your money back. That money is lost forever. So again, um, if you're going to buy something, use a credit card. Don't use a bank card and be sure you know with whom you are dealing. Um, the, the amount of stories that we see are, it, it's, it's really shocking. And while we're on the topic of doing business with strangers, a lot of what I talked about today has to do with online, but this happens in real life too. The biggest complaints and, and the things that keep my, my team of investigators busy is dealing with companies that are just bad business people. Uh, the most common would be home improvement contractors. And again, it goes back to not doing your homework. If you're going to spend $100,000 to build an addition on your home, 
you'd better ask around about this contractor. And again, people sometimes think that the cheapest guy is going to be the best one. And that is not always the case. And in fact, a lot of times that is not the case. If you're going to build a, an addition on your home and you get three bids and one bids for 100,000 and the second bids for 95,000 and the third bid was for 50,000, is it because the two guys were super expensive on the first two bids or is it because the third bid, all they're going to do is take your deposit money and you're never going to see them again. Now, a lot of these contractors, the typical way that contractors work is they get a third down as a deposit. They get a third uh, installment when they're about halfway through the job. And then once their job is finished and it passes inspection, you give them the final payment. If a contractor shows up and takes your deposit and leaves and never does anything, that's theft by deception. That's a criminal act and you can call the police on that. But if you're doing, let's say a bathroom renovation and the guy shows up with a sledgehammer, destroys your bathroom and says, okay, I'll be back tomorrow to start cleaning up and working on it and never comes back. That is not a criminal act, although it should be. It is technically, they're gonna say that this is a contractual issue because You've hired a person, they started the work, and they never came back. Now you have to sue them. And although I'd love to tell you that these folks belong in jail and they should be arrested, it does not usually work that way. Most police departments will say, you know, if the guy started the job, you have a contract with them, you need to pursue that through the court system. And it might be small claims court if it's under 3,000, or it might be, it might go with what they call special civil part, which is under 15,000, you can sit down and, and try to mediate. Um, through the court system to get your money back. But a lot of these, these businesses, which are not really businesses, they're really more like criminals, um, they don't show up. So even if the court finds in your favor and the other person doesn't show up, there's a default judgment against them for your $50,000 that you lost. But good luck trying to, to collect one penny of that. Because even if you can find these people, they have to have some money to take from them to give you restitution. If they if they're basically, uh, you know, folks that deal in cash and, and they hide all their money and they don't have any assets, you can try to put a lien on their property, but you might be the 50th person in line and you will never see your money. So my point being, when you're hiring folks, do the background before you give anybody a penny of your money, because we see this all the time. And unfortunately, no, nothing ever happens to these guys. They, it's so hard to really track them down and get anybody to be arrested or, or to stop them from doing it. Um, another very common one this time of year, driveway pavers. These guys knock on your door. They say, hey, I'm doing your neighbor's driveway. I've got some extra asphalt. You want me to do yours? And you hand them money and they just leave and they never come back. They're famous for doing it or they'll tear up your driveway because they're gonna do a full driveway replacement they tear it up, they take your $2,000 deposit, and they never return. So not only did you lose $2,000, they've destroyed pieces of your driveway. Um, again, it's your fault because you didn't, you didn't do any background. you got to know who you're dealing with. You've got to go online and, and check some of this stuff out. It does not do you any good to be a detective after the fact. You, you really want to protect yourself. The biggest complaints we see, home improved co co contractors, landscapers, new and used car dealers, and furniture stores. New and used car dealers, when I first started working at Division, you know, you, you hear the cliche about the used car dealers, and you just think like it's something that you see in the movies. And I wish that was true, but I have to tell you, there are so many used car scams out there. It is absolutely unbelievable. And unfortunately, our ability to put these people out of business, it, it just does not exist. They, they, they work with almost impunity out there. It's so difficult to make anything stick against them. A real car dealer wants to protect their reputation, and they will usually work with us, and we will be able to mediate something that will make everybody either equally happily or equally miserable, but we'll, we'll mediate. But there are so many scammers out there that are selling cars online that you can't even find these folks. And you'd be shocked at how many people will spend $10,000 on a vehicle that they have never seen or never had their mechanic take a look at to say, yes, this is a good car, you should buy this. We see problems all the time. And honestly, you've gotta go online, 
read reviews, talk to friends and neighbors who have purchased a vehicle and were, and were happy with their dealings. You know, sometimes, you know, it's worth spending the extra couple of dollars to deal with a reputable business than trying to get some kind of crazy discount that you think you're going to get a great deal and you end up getting scammed. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Furniture stores, you know, we, we don't see a ton of problems, but it's not uncommon that furniture stores have big delays. Um, up to three months is, is okay. If it's taking more than three months, they got to tell you that when you give them a deposit and you have to sign off that you're willing to wait the extra amount of time. With COVID, there was a lot of delays. The supply chain was heavily interrupted, um, but still, you, you want to make sure that you know what your time frame is when you make a purchase. And then when the purchase arrives and you inspect it, if it was scratched or dented or broken in transit, a good furniture store will take care of that. A bad furniture store will say, you must have done that. It arrived perfectly. And then you end up back in small claims court to try to figure out whose fault it is. And then you end up with the he said, she said. And so you've got a problem on your hands. Way to deal with that. Do your scouting ahead of time. Make sure you're dealing with a company that has a good reputation. I know I keep saying some of the same things over and over again, but it's to drive the point home because you'd be shocked at how many people never check. <clears throat> you know, a, a, a dumb criminal walks into a bank with a gun. And if they get arrested, they're going to go to jail for a long time on a felony charge for the gun and for armed robbery. And, and you're not going to see them for many years. A smart criminal just opens up a business. And they take deposits and they either never do the job or they do half a job. And then when the heat starts to come down on them, they close that business and they reopen under a new name. And then we get more complaints and we look to see who the business owner is. And son of a gun, it's the same person we've been seeing for the last 10 years. <clears throat> and unfortunately, excuse me, they don't go to jail. They just go on to their new business. So, you know, again, what, do I, what am I going to just tell you? You've got to go online. You've got to do your research. Okay, so hopefully you've learned something out of my ramblings of the last half hour or so. And I would love to hear what you're interested in. So if you have any questions, you can please send them over to my librarian assistant over here. And she's gonna tell me if you've got any questions that I can answer for you. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much for that talk. That was very informative. Um, does anybody have any questions? If so, um, please write them in the chat and we can answer them now. No, I'm really being shy today or answer all the questions. Let's see if anyone writes anything in. Do they give fake references? Um, that's a good question. Um, yes, criminals will give you fake references, but you can usually figure that out. You know, if they, if they give you, um, you can call my last customer and you call somebody and it's their cousin saying, oh, they're great. That sounds good. But you may have to make more than one phone call. Or like I said, if you go online, check the Better Business Bureau um, the Better Business Bureau does rate businesses with a, a letter system like you use when you were in grade school, A to F. If they have a, a rating of F, then you should be running away from them. Uh, most good businesses will have an A plus rating or an A rating or a B plus rating, maybe if they had a complaint. But the businesses have the opportunity to try to resolve those complaints with the BBB and their consumer. If they don't, then they sometimes end up back at our office. Um, where we have statute authority to go after them if it's a consumer fraud issue. But, but yes, you know, a, the, a bad business person um, or someone posing as a business who's not a business can give you fake references. So again, you got to play detective. And honestly, the search engines are, are a great way to avoid those problems because most people when they've been ripped off are very happy to tell the world about it and you can find the, that information. Sometimes you'd be shocked, like if you Google the name of the business owner, you'll find their name popping up on a headline from a newspaper. You know, some of these people have gone to jail on, on major crimes, and when they come out, they go right back to doing what they're good at. Um, we had a, 
uh, a home improvement contractor who was building a house for somebody. The person had done time in jail for forgery. They came out. They don't know anything about building a home, but they do know how to forge documents to make it look like they're getting their inspections done and they're getting their approvals from the town. And so they were taking money from the consumer and literally building a home for somebody. And they spent, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a million dollars to build a home that was not habitable. And by the time the town figured out that someone was building a house without getting any approvals or permits, the town went and looked for the inspections. All of the inspection and approval documents had been forged. They, they, were, they were non-existent. So the guy who did the job disappeared and the consumer watched as the house was demolished right down to the foundation. And they're at a quarter of a million dollars. And eventually um, this guy was arrested. The, I think it was the Tom River Police Department put handcuffs on the guy. And so that I'll go through the court system and maybe he'll go to jail. But the bad news is the homeowner's not getting back their money. So again, do lots of homework before you give people money. Okay, we have another question. It says, if I get scammed, does it help to get a lawyer or is that just another expense? Depends on the nature of the scam. The first thing I would recommend is that you bring it to our office, go online and fill out the form online and give us as much information as you can. If it's a, if it's a bad experience dealing with a real business, we can usually help you out through mediation. If it's a criminal enterprise, then we usually have a difficult time finding them. Or if we do find them, they don't cooperate. I, I have the authority to subpoena folks and have them come in to talk to them, but that's only if we can find them. Sometimes we try to issue a subpoena and the address that we have is wrong. And we have uh, encrypted computer software that we use like the police department uses to gain access to backgrounds. And so we can try to search for people, but again, some you know, if you're dealing with a criminal, these folks are already in the wind. They've changed their address 10 times, and we just we just don't have any ability to find them. So start with us. We work for free, um, and it won't cost you anything to file a complaint. Let us try to help you. If we can't help you, um, we will tell you that your next course of action would be to go to either small claims court or special civil part, which you don't require an attorney to have. If it's more than $15,000, you, you may end up having to hire an attorney and going after somebody. But unfortunately, many times, even if you win in court, you won't see a penny from these folks if they're bad actors, because um, a default judgment just means they didn't show up, the court found in your favor, and good luck trying to get a penny out of these guys. Very frustrating. You would think that the laws would be written to protect you in such a way that people go to jail when they rip people off, but it doesn't seem to work that way. It's very, very frustrating. Um, we have another patron who says, I find com my community page helpful for recommendations and wants to know what you think of those. Yeah, that's great because your community page is typically your friends and neighbors who have had good or bad experiences dealing with a company. Um, I, I have a, I use Facebook. I have a Facebook community page for my subdivision where I live. And I've gotten to know a lot of my neighbors through that page. And so it's at the point now where somebody says, you know, my air conditioner broke, who should I call? 10 of their neighbors will say, I used, you know, one of these 10 different companies and they were great. Or some people will pipe up and say, don't use, you know, this company because they were terrible and they wouldn't come back. That's my problem. So yeah, getting references from people that you know and you trust, definitely a good start to your, your research. And then once you've got, let's say, two or three names, get bids from the three of them and then run those names through search engines to see what kind of reviews they have, check with the BBB and, and you know, make your best educated decision at that point. Um, and again, it sounds terrible that you have to do all this homework before you hire somebody to do a simple job, but if you don't know the company, you really have to protect yourself. And it's different, you know, if you're dealing with a mom pop store that's been in your town for 20 years and they've got a good reputation, okay, that's great. You're probably not gonna have an issue. It's when you're dealing with companies you've never heard of or you're new to an area and you don't know the people, you know, you really gotta do your homework, especially on large ticket items. And especially when it's in the problem industries, your home improvement contractors, your landscapers, your new and used car dealers, 
you know, you, you really want to check on those because that's where you just see a ton of problems. Any other questions? We don't have another question. Does anybody have any other questions they like to enter into the chat? I think one just popped up. Was that another one, new one? Let's see here. Um, oh, yes. Okay, so much of people's information is publicly available on Facebook. Where should I draw the line between what is public and what, and what is private? So there's all these games people play on Facebook. And these games would be, I'm trying to, I, I can't really pick or click on them, but, um, you know, people will go online and talk about where they went to college. Where did you meet your husband or wife? And so Joe Smith will say, I met my wife, Patty, at Penn State. Well, somebody that you don't know knows your name, knows your wife's name, and knows that you both went to Penn State. These are all pieces of the puzzle that they're trying to collect along with as much other data as they can so that they can steal your identity. And it's, it's a shame to live in a world where you, you, know, you have to protect yourself so much, but you really do have to be very cognizant of what you are sharing in a public forum. Because again, you know, I'm a public person. You can find my name, you can find my address, you can find my phone number pretty quickly. But I'm going to be very protective about things like my driver's license or my social security number um, or background information that, that I don't want you to know because you're going to take that and you're going to try to create a fake Facebook profile or worse, open up a bank account in my name or even worse, try to get a mortgage for a home in my name. Um, Recently, my wife just, we, we were randomly checking our credit score, which I suggest that you all do from time to time. And we saw a problem on my wife's credit score. And I'll tell you, my wife pays her bill. She's got great credit. And as it turned out, somebody purchased something from a company online. And we never knew that the person opened up the account under my wife's name. We never knew that any merchandise was ordered and sent to Chicago. Um, and this company was very happy to put up the account under my wife's name and send merchandise and a bill to an address that was not ours. And we had to fight with them and they didn't want to hear it. I ended up having to call the local police department and file a complaint because we had to prove that it was identity theft and we weren't the ones trying to scam the company. And then I had to open up a file with one of my investigators for them to follow up on with the company. And it took a couple of months to get our credit fixed. And that was a major ding on our credit because according to Expedia, not Expedia, um, Experian, um, we weren't paying that bill. And the reason we weren't paying the bill was we never ordered anything. We didn't have an account when we didn't even know about it. It had sat there for three months before we randomly checked our credit. So you can get free credit reports. And I suggest that you use uh, the, three, the three big ones, um, Experian, um, and I just totally blanked out the other two, but if we go online, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you. Um, but go online and, and check your credit scores because that's what you'll find uh, if someone is, is trying to steal your identity and, and opening up accounts that you don't know about. Okay, so um, two questions in relation to Facebook. On a Facebook profile, um, should you remove your personal info and what precautions should you take with Facebook Marketplace um, for people who have started selling items? So the personal info, again, that's, that's up to you. And it also depends to some extent on who you share your information with. If your Facebook group, if you only have 50 friends, and these are people that you know and you trust who might be more willing to share your information. Or you might set information to private or to only your friends you know, that can see it. If you've got 5,000 friends, then you should set up your page so that only um, close friends might have access to it. There's different ways to filter it on Facebook. Um, but you know, the things that you post, I, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to always set it for the public, just set it for your friends so that you can kind of keep a little bit of control on it. Um, but if you have a lot of friends and you use Facebook to sell things, then 
you have to be a little bit more uh, cognizant about about what you're sharing. And, and you know, I'm I'm an author. I have an author's page on Facebook. And so I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook. Do I know all these people? No, I probably know a couple of hundred of them. And the other several thousand, I don't know who these people are. So I try to be careful about, you know, what I'm going to put out there. Facebook is, is popular and it works and it's okay to use it. But again, whether you're the buyer or the seller, you have to just make sure that you're being smart about you know about what you're doing. I, I, I'm not super familiar with, with it, so I don't know all the ins and outs of Facebook Marketplace. I'm sure if you were to go to YouTube and and Google or YouTube search, you know, how to use Facebook Marketplace, you could probably read articles that will give you information and, and some guidance. And honestly, that's what I suggest with almost everything nowadays is just spend a few minutes reading and see what other people are saying or what other agencies are saying about you know what's safe and what's not safe out there because the information you know the, the good news is you live in an age where the information is really available to you if you want to take the time to do your homework the bad news is you have to take the time to do your homework because there are so many people out there who are looking to rip you off and you just have to go slowly don't don't work in a sense of urgency especially when you're getting phone calls and things like that. If someone sounds like they're trying to intimidate you or make you work extra fast, that's, I did, and just hang up the phone. The, the government doesn't call you. You know, the police department doesn't randomly call you. IT doesn't randomly call you. When you get these weird calls, um, you should be comfortable enough that you listen to the little voice inside that said something doesn't feel right. And when that happens, just hang up. Another question popped up? Um, yes. So we had a thank you very much for all of this great information. Oh, thank um, you. And will the slides be made available? Uh, I believe the library is available. Yes. 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 So these slides, these slides will be available. And again, if you ever have any questions, please, you can call our office. Um, our phone number is up there, 431-7900. Also, if you're going to hire a company to do a job for you, and you're curious as to whether or not our office has complaints filed against them, you can call the office and give us the name of the company and say, I'm interested in hiring you know, this plumber or this contractor or whatever. Do you have uh, complaints filed against them? And we can look in our database and tell you whether or not we've had complaints filed. Um, we're limited as to what we can share with you. I can't make recommendations to you. But we can certainly tell you if, um, yes, we've had you know, nine complaints filed against these folks in the last two years. And so you, know, you may want to think about whether or not you want to hire that person if there's multiple complaints against them. Or we might say you had one complaint and um, they took care of it, which you know, it's no business is going to work at uh, an A-plus rating 100% of the time where they've never had a complaint. Everybody is going to have an issue with a product you know, or a sale. It's what they do about the complaint that separates the good businesses from the bad businesses. The greatest contractor in the world can build something and you know, one of the contractors does a bad job on something. If you call them and you say, I've got a problem with the tub you put and it's leaking and they come out right away and they fix it, okay, not a problem, right? They fixed it. If they ignore your complaints and it comes to us and we call them up and they won't, they won't fix it, now it's gonna stay in their file that, that you know, they had a bad issue and so, you can, you can check with us and, and find that stuff out, which is not a bad idea to call us before you uh, make a big, you know, big purchase or you're gonna hire somebody on a, on a big job. Okay, so that was our last question. David, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to all of our patrons who tuned in today to, um, to get all it's, of this great information. It's my pleasure. And I, I like doing things like this because I will tell you 100% certainty it is much easier to prevent these problems than it is for us to fix them after the fact. When we deal with good businesses that just have a complaint, um, they will work with us and we will mediate and we will work on your behalf to try to fix that problem. And most of the time, we're able to help. When we're dealing with bad businesses or scammers or outright criminals who are pretending to be uh, a business, it is very difficult to get you your money back. So before you give someone your hard-earned money, know who you're dealing with. And if nothing else, 
I hope you are going to set your phones so that only calls come in from your list of contacts. And if it's somebody who really needs to talk to you, they're going to leave you a message and you will call them back and, and deal with it later. But don't get bullied into making rash decisions that are going to cost you money. So thanks very much for tuning in. I, I hope it was worth your time. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you all have a great day.